The latest Pokemon Battle Royale I helped Termina Montage create is out, and it may be the most controversial one yet because people love their starters. Go watch that first because I'm going to spoil everything. You have three seconds. The best part is there's no Sylveon. <laughs> hang on. Ah. <laughs> Hang on, allow me to explain. So in this battle royale, we have all of the evolutions of all of the starter Pokemon. Now, obviously like Oshawott and most of the rest of the basic unevolved Pokemon are not going to win. But by having them here, it leads to more opportunities for jokes, deaths, and interesting tidbits. Folks gotta remember creative liberties are always taken with these. Though for most interactions, we base things on like the Pokedex entries, the anime personalities, gameplay mechanics, and competitive VGC and TCG meta. But one creative liberty we could not take was Sylveon being here because, well, well, Eevee is only a starter Pokemon in games like Pokemon XD, Conquest, and Let's Go Eevee. Which is also why Eevee has the balloons. But in none of these games is your starter Eevee able to evolve into Sylveon. Conquest is a Gen 5 game, and your starter Eevee does not evolve at all in Let's Go Eevee. You can try, but without glitchy exploits, it's not possible. This is also why there's no Raichu, and why the Eevee finally gets an Evolution Stone scene exists. What? Yes, that was everyone's feelings when Let's Go Eevee came out. Now then, let's watch the whole battle again and pause for commentary on some of the lesser known details and explain why things happen the way they do. I love the occasional Hisuian balls, but like, why does Poipol make a cameo here? Well, because Poipol is a starter Pokemon in its home dimension, but since we the players ourselves never get one as a starter, it's not included in the battle itself. Oh, Charmander drowned. If the tip of its tail goes out, it dies, according to the decks. Grovile here is a reference to the Grovile and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers. He's got a time gear, so he time travels away. Oh, the crowd is upon us. So here, the entire Venusaur and Meganium lines are said to have a pleasant aroma that calms people and Pokemon. It weakens their fighting spirit. It nullifies their aggressive emotions. Just like, chill out, man. Hence also Venusaur's very bloodshot eyes. This also relates to why Delphox decided to hang out with them. This fire psychic Pokemon is partially based on Delphic Oracles, basically the ancient world's future seers who, for lack of a better term, would burn herbs and get really, really high to get their visions. Now this evolutions bit is fun, opening with a nod to Eevee's Z-move, but Espeon's future sight makes it realize it's gotta get out of there before the Eevee chaos ensues. Skipping ahead to Blastoise, who still shoots from its head instead of its cannons, the Pokedex says it's capable of blasting this water through thick steel, so most Pokemon are no match for it, even Empoleon's own steel wings after a while. That said, Blastoise and Feraligator's heads are still no match for a Mach 3 water bullet from the agile secret agent Inteleon's dual water pistols. They are slow and easy targets, too. Moving to where most of the fire types are, a three-way is happening with all of the fire furry, I, I mean fire fighting type Pokemon, setting the grassland ablaze and spooking Incineroar away. Incineroar is a fire dark type heel wrestler who really has no chance here. So the scaredy cat leaves and stumbles upon the opera singing Primarina, who gets to experience Incineroar's Throat Chop, one of its signature moves. The move prevents its target from using sound-based moves. Not that it matters much, since Incineroar then Smash Bros style back throws Primarina. Sceptile then approaches as a common Smash Bros wannabe, and it double teams, but Incineroar's spinning Darkest Lariat doesn't care about that. So, the Typhlosion Explosion. Let's back up a bit. After incinerating some lessers, Charizard goes for the nearest worthy opponent it can find to Smash Bros up throw or just do an anime amount of seismic tossing onto. Charizard is a bit of a show-off, and his victim just happens to be Typhlosion. What's happening here relates to a few of Typhlosion's Pokedex entries. It can hide behind a shimmering heat haze that it creates using its intense flames. Typhlosion creates blazing explosive blasts that turn everything to cinders. Hence the heat warping effect here, and it has a secret devastating move. It rubs its blazing fur together to cause huge explosions. Only here, it's not just rubbing some of its fur together to make an explosion. No, its entire back is rubbing against Charizard as the rapid wind pushes against it, causing a big explosion in the air, separating the two, and an even bigger, more devastating explosion when it crashes into the ground. Its Pokedex category as the Volcano Pokemon. Well, it's true. So the fiery shockwave of the explosion 
expands, sending many lighter Pokémon away and vaporizing most of the grass types, but not Chestnut, who can easily withstand explosions just fine. And Torterra's ground type and being partially dug into the ground already means fire doesn't affect it as much. The smart and tricky Meowskerata decides to hide underneath it, but these flames obviously change the weather a bit like all major fires, and Swamperts are able to detect weather changes with their sensitive fins. They also like digging themselves into holes on the shores. And now, to try and better protect its beach, it uses Earthquake to cause the Earth to rise around the area. But Earthquake is a devastating move that hits all non-flying battling Pokémon, so in this case, it's gonna hit the whole island. And notably, Swampert is one of only two starter Pokémon able to naturally learn the move Earthquake, the other being Torterra. Now with two Earthquakes and a devastating explosion happening, the island has no chance. Swampert gets pushed back by Torterra's Quake, and in turn, Swampert does what out of all of the starter Pokémon, only Swampert can naturally do. It uses Surf, another hit every opponent attack that floods and flushes the island, still being shaken by the Quakes. Shaken, not stirred. You get it? Because this Pokémon line is literally a James Bond reference? <clears throat> also, I know people who blinked and missed it will wonder where Quaquaval was during all this, and the answer is here, being eaten by Superior. Leaning more on anime logic here, only a few of the Pokémon were fast, strong, or cunning enough not to be defeated by the island-wide onslaught, and Skeledurge was somehow one of them. It sings its lamenting song, a dirge, a sad tune to funeral music as the ghosts of the fallen starters, which were congregated down into the chasm, float up and away. As does Skeledurge's own spirit friend, the flaming bird on its nose that it uses as a microphone. They are all being absorbed by Hisuian Typhlosion, a spirit medium who keeps 108 spirits bound to its flame to power its attacks before sending them off to the proper afterlife. But meanwhile, Meowskareta pops out and uses its trickster magician magic to fool Torterra into eating a flower bomb. Dodongo dislikes smoke, and Chestnut, the White Knight, hates trickery like this, and, of course, is basically bomb-proof. Now it's time for an iconic top 10 anime battles, Greninja vs. Charizard, and despite the type advantage, Charizard wins. Because Charizard, just like in the anime. But specifically here, Greninja tries stealthily putting out Charizard's tail, after all, that's what defeated Charmander. But despite this common belief, Charizard is shown completely submerged with a still-burning tail quite occasionally. It no longer has this weakness. And if Charizard becomes furious, the flame on the tip of its tail flares up in a whitish-blue color. Which is powering Charizard up enough to defeat Greninja even after all of its previous battle damage. Quite the upset, again. Just like Hisui and Typhlosion not really being able to do anything after powering up. Hmm. Well, in a throwback to our very first Pokémon Battle Royale, we have this exact scene. We have Decidueye, who can knock and fire an arrow at an enemy in a tenth of a second, so its battles are decided in the blink of an eye. Well, Samurott's dex entry says, in the time it takes a foe to blink, it can draw and sheathe its scimitars attached to its front legs. And then there's Infernape, who uses all of its limbs to fight in its own unique style. It is beaten by none in terms of quickness. This is a very close battle then, huh? Though, the Pokedex also says Decidueye is basically cool and cautious. When it's caught by surprise, it is seized by panic. So, when Samurott slices its arrows and Infernape catches them all, it panics and loses first, followed by Samurott because of Infernape's flame never going out and its no limit fallacy, and Samurott's typical one slash and then put the sword away fighting style puts it at a disadvantage here too. But then, here comes the Hisuian varieties, catching the Infernape completely off guard. Deja vu? Another Samurott and another Decidueye? That Decidueye still has no chance, but now this Samurott is evil, and is now known for mercilessly slashing again and again ceaselessly. The off-guard Infernape has little chance to respond before it even realizes what's going on. But then Samurott itself gets distracted by its own bloodlust, and is defeated by the other two firefighting types. Now you'll notice there's quite a lot of fire types remaining, so let's talk some meta stuff. It was all always going to be mostly fire types in the end. The fire type starters are, in general or as a whole, the best of the bunch. First off, the most resistances, the middlest weaknesses, and plus there's the status effect that plenty of their moves can just apply. Some guaranteed. Burn. It not only deals damage over time, but also cuts the physical attack damage of the burned Pokémon in half. 
and only fire types are immune to burn, so yes, even the water types get burned, and now their attacks are less effective on the fires. Ugh. The other two types have nothing like this, unless you count like seated. And also, for some reason, Game Freak decided that most fire starters just have a higher base stat total. I mean, like in Gen 1, 2, and 4, the fire starters' total stats are 534, compared to grass's 525 and water's 530. Also, fire fighting is a very good offensive type combo, and there are three of them. The fire types also tend to be on the more speedy and offensive side, more so than the other types as a whole, and their moves tend to be on the more damaging side as well. But if you were to tally them up and see how many starters of each type get into a game's OU or Uber tiers, not counting the Eevee lotions, because let's be honest, they don't really have a chance. You get water with 11, grass with 13, most of those being Venusaur in every stinking gen, uh, but then fire's here with 17. So yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fire in the end, which in turn also means the grass types get kind of screwed pretty early on. But I think it's fitting, I mean, just consider the general properties of fire. Ooh, I can make a plant grow and have you sneeze. Watch out, my leaves might be a little pokey. Oh, I can make you moist, and through an incredible amount of focused effort, I can pierce and or drown you. I have no choice but to melt your flesh beyond repair by simply bumping into you. I turn your forests into ash and your water into steam. We are the driving force of destruction and the inevitable demise of all ecosystems. Sure, water puts out the fire, but it's a type triangle here. They should theoretically be balanced. But as the anime and card game shows us, type advantage is not everything. That said, calculating in secondary types gets really long-winded if I were to explain everything, but like, most of the best water types get kind of screwed. Yeah, Hisui and Samurott, and Greninja especially, can keep up with the fire types given their watery advantage, but that dark. There are three really good fire fighting types here. Some grass fighters too. Primarina's fairy typing, Empoleon's steel, those hinder their effectiveness when fighting the fire types. And, and yeah, Swampert is really good itself. Its water ground type means that it super resists fire type attacks, hence it lasting the longest and holding off an entire group of fire types by itself with a little bit of help of a little Sobble, that's his name. Couldn't remember. He's also, fun fact, has the highest base stat total out of all of the starters at 535. Only one higher than most of the fires, but interesting design choice, King Freak. Um, but yeah, honestly, it would have a very good chance of winning this if not for that one pesky little thing. It's four times weakness to grass. A third of the Pokemon are grass. Now you die. And so we are left with Charizard and Blaziken, two powerhouses of the metagame, almost always Uber or OU tier, and Pikachu. Pikachu! Uh, Pikachu was OU in the Gen 2 games. It's gotta count for something, yeah? Ooh, and yeah, Charizard's got that flying type, so it's weak to electric. So we're left with the final showdown, Blaziken versus Pikachu. Blaziken makes sense, given everything we've talked about already, but, but, but why Pikachu? Well, a number of reasons. Firstly, it's funny. <laughs> I mean, it's a tiny little rat! It's like zooping! Beep, 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 beep. Oh, I'm a squishy little orb that sounds like beep, and I'm fighting this giant flaming bird that punches and kicks like a man! It's funny. Nobody expected this cute little orb to make it this far. But also, this isn't just any Pikachu who's already the mascot of the franchise and clearly is capable of overcoming many great challenges as seen in the anime. No, this is a Pikachu who can fly with its balloon ride, who can surf with a board, who has a tertiary ability of sorts to just sometimes ignore or remove status effects who has a higher crit chance, who has four signature moves with unique effects, like Splishy Splash, it's a water type move that has a 30% chance of paralyzing, Floaty Fall, did you mean freaking flinch for me please, Zippy Zap, a priority move that is also always a crit, and Pika Pa Pow, a strong electric attack that it knows as a secret fifth move? What? 
it has 110 more stat total than your regular everyday Pikachus and guaranteed maximum IVs. I want in this thing's bloodline. And to top that all off, it can sometimes just ignore being knocked out to zero HP again and again and again. This is Let's Go Pikachu's partner Pikachu. A Pikachu so good, Game Freak locked it into its game. Not allowed to be transferred out. And yes, partner Eevee has the same sorts of buffs, but its normal typing and being focused on trying to evolve prevents it from being quite as good. And plus, it doesn't have the cards. More so than any other form of Pokemon media, the trading card game has extreme power creep, so the cards from today will almost always be better than the cards a few or more sets ago. In fact, right now, Charizard V-Star is considered the most powerful and devastating card in the game. Oh yeah, just 320 damage or 130 that turns into 230 if it has any damage, and it can just do that over and over again? Hmm. So all the more reason for it to reach third place. Charizard cards are often the most valued and sought after by collectors too, so it's not like they needed to make it this strong, but they did to say something about it. Surprisingly though, it doesn't see a ton of play despite its overwhelming power. But you know what did? Radiant Greninja. In the 2022 Trading Card Game Championship, half of the top 10 used it for its way good ability. Though, interestingly, none of the top three players used it. You know what the three toppest champions of the Trading Card Game last year used a lot? Oh, you guessed it. All three of them heavily utilized Flying Pikachu V and Flying Pikachu V Max. Now, we won't be considering the V Max card because that's the card game's equivalent of Gigantamaxing and such. There was none of that here. But regular Flying Pikachu V is also the closest the card game gets to Let's Go Partner Pikachu and its power level. And if all top three champions used it, it must be good, so let's read it. Okay, 190 HP with the move Thundershock. It does 20 damage and a 50% chance to paralyze. That doesn't seem... I feel like a regular Pikachu could do that. You just cut the HP down a little, so what's... Oh right, what's the other attack? So 120 damage. Decent, not bad at all. But a 50% chance to just ignore all damage and effects of the opponent's attacks next turn, and you can just keep doing that? A move like that? No wonder it'd be good! And then when you evolve it into VMAX, it's like a, it's, it's just a full on, oh, no wonder it won kind of card. Jeez! Okay, so where does Blaziken stand in the card game? Oh, not well. Uh, just two modern cards, Blaziken V and VMAX, which again, we're not gonna count. So I read a lot of reviews by people who know the card game better than me, and basically the conclusion here is that Blaziken V is... It's okay. You would only ever really use it to turn it into VMAX, but even then, Blaziken VMAX is decent at best. Very middle of the road. So Blaziken versus Pikachu? One, one, two! Oh, well, you see, Blaziken, it's because it was still at full HP when you started fighting it. It just ignored all of the attacks at the start of the Royale, thanks to the cards and its balloons, and also its partner Pikachu, which can just ignore being knocked out sometimes. Isn't this game great? But all of that sounds like it's leading to a Pikachu victory, so why didn't it? Well, beyond the obvious that none of us want it to. I mean, it's an unevolved rat that we see every second of the day already. <laughs> it overcomes miserable odds on the reg in the anime constantly. It's cute, too cute to be this powerful. And it's all so tiring. This one's shaped like a bean. But yes, even in loss, it's still a very close battle. This part of the Royales are always tricky. The TCG, board games, spin-off games, and anime though, they all pull from the main video game first. So of course we prioritize looking at the main video game stats, meta, and Pokedex entries first, and then supplement it with the rest. If we were to prioritize the card game, yeah, Pikachu would win, no questions asked, but balancing it out with the main games, Pikachu was only OU once, before Blaziken even existed, and Blaziken has been OU or uber banned this whole time. But why though? What makes Blaziken so much better than the rest? 
Well, it's fire type, first of all. Already a huge advantage because this is a free-for-all battle royale setting and everything is going to catch on fire no matter what happens. But also, as stated, firefighting is an amazing offensive combo. Like, most of the best offensive attack moves are one of these two types. And it gets its stab bonus with all of them. Really, at first, the only thing keeping Blaziken back in Gents 3 and 4 was its speed. Blaziken's speed is only a little bit above average, surprisingly. So while it could easily destroy most Pokémon that it's faster than then, it's only faster than a little over half of them. Oh jeez, and partner Pikachu's speed is 120, what? But something happened in Generation 5. Game Freak occasionally goes back and buffs older Pokémon so they can try to keep up with the power creep, but what they did to Blaziken haunts competitive players to this day. So much so that even Smogon's own webpage explaining how the whole tier system works has this illustration featuring Blaziken at the top, almost like it's the poster child of Pokémon being so good, they're just outright banned. All Game Freak did was fix its little speed problem by giving it access to the speed boost ability, which raises its speed every turn by one stage. Could use protect on turn one and get a free speed boost. Maybe play some mind games, make you think it's gonna use protect on turn one, so you buff yourself. But no, it used swords dance instead. Now you attack, ooh, it used protect. Top it off with flare blitz and a high jump or low kick, and Blaziken was suddenly considered an uncounterable Pokemon. Not even just this one specific setup. As long as it had that ability, <sighs> if someone threw out Blaziken, you had a turn or two to take it out before it just up and swept your entire team, no matter how tanky they are. One shot, dead. Swept. You let Blaziken speed up and maybe even buff its attack with a swords dance, or maybe a previous Pokemon just set up a sunny day. So it's game over already. No contest concede. Like, maybe the best you can hope for is, uh, that team has Blaziken, maybe that Blaziken will only take out half of my team instead of the entirety of it. Entire classes of Pokémon and entire strategies and playstyles were turned on their heads because of this one freaking bird. And then Game Freak went and gave it a Mega. <laughs> Bonus fact, you can actually give a Life Orb to it, and now its attack is even better than its Mega 2. Isn't this game fun? That all being said though, it was recently unbanned in later Sword and Shield due to different Pokémon being in the lead of the metagame. Also, Game Freak had buffed some other older Pokémon, and they introduced some new moves and items that help you deal with the Blaziken problem, and they even removed some moves that Blaziken used to have access to, so now, it actually has some decent counters that are easy to come by in the main meta game, so the actual use of Blaziken. Well, you could almost think of it as like the rest of Pokémon finally power crept up to Blaziken's level, but you see, when it comes to those perfect Blaziken counters, none of them are starters. They're like slow bro, and so. In a free-for-all battle royale with only starters, I believe Blaziken still has not a guaranteed victory, but the best chance at coming out on top, with partner Pikachu and Charizard coming in close. The dang duo of Game Freak favoritization privilege! If Swampert could hide and avoid the grass types until the very end, it too would have a very good chance. Torterra might be able to tank it out if it wasn't such a slow, dumb, and lazy tortoise, and Venusaur is actually also on a lot of OU and Uber tier lists when designed in a very specific way, but in lore, it too is just kind of slow and dumb and sleepy. Oh, I'm... I'm on my own herbs, you hear what I'm saying? Hmm. Don't make me mad, I might wiggle a whip at you. I'm a Venusaur. But okay, what are your takes? Maybe you're making this face because I made some heinous miscalculation, but like, obviously, this is incredibly complicated and I am simplifying a lot here. So, what would you calculate differently? Who do you think would also have a pretty decent chance? And also, what was your favorite moment in the battle? 
I love this one. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you're interested in Pokemon content that is a little too hashtag smart for its own good. We recently explained the lore and designs of the Paradox Pokemon, as well as the intricate details of individual gym badges. Or maybe you're more inclined on insulting each state by giving them an insulting Pokemon based on their worst aspects. That's the kind of stuff we try to do here. Also, I love you, so definitely subscribe.